national and international significance with a goal to foster understanding and appreciation of contemporary art through dialogue and critical conversations. Tonight's lecture by Ellen O'Hara Slavic highlights a significant internationally recognized artist who we have been fortunate to bring to UCCS. Her exhibition, Dark Archive, opens tomorrow night at the Goka downtown space and you are all invited to join us there for the opening. It, it's now my pleasure to introduce Daisy McGowan, the director of the Galleries of Contemporary Art. Daisy uh, has a long relationship with Ellen, and this is uh, an, addition, a, an addition to the work that has already begun. And I know Daisy and Lene and the entire team uh, of students at GOCA have been hard at work in the gallery downtown, literally hanging hundreds of pieces of art for this opening over the past several weeks. So without further ado, Daisy. Thank you, David. Well, I am delighted to welcome you all to tonight's lecture. As David said, it's the first in our 11th season of the Visiting Artists and Critics Series. And I've only been here 12 years, so that's pretty much my entire time. Um, it is uh, a collaboration between our VAPA department, visual art, and art history in particular. And there are a number of these lectures planned for the entire year, so I hope you'll take a look at the schedule. Tonight's lecture will run about 35 minutes, and then we should have some time for your questions at the end, so please think of them throughout the talk. I would like to take a moment to acknowledge the series sponsors, our UCCS Student Government Association, the B. Radenberg Foundation, our um, Colorado Creative, Creative Industry Sponsor, and the CU President's Fund for the Humanities, as well as UCCS Visual and Performing Arts Department, and GOCA's wonderful Donor Circle members. If you are a GOCA PAC member, could you raise your hand? And so I can say thank you. You helped us make this all happen. We fundraise for 100% of our program uh, at GOCA, and so it's so important to have that support. I also want to express huge thanks. As David mentioned, our UCCS student employees went above and beyond with this exhibition that we're opening tomorrow night. And they have given so much time and passion to realizing that. I know the artist is grateful. I am so grateful. And um, it's wonderful to see our students learning these skills. But also, truly, we could not do this without them. I'm sure you'll all be inspired after tonight's talk to join us tomorrow night the opening of Dark Archive, a new exhibition that Ellen's going to share more insight into tonight. And now, it's my honor to share a bit of background on our guest artist uh, with you all. Ellen O'Hara Slavic has exhibited her work internationally and is also an author. Publications include Bomb After Bomb, A Violent Cartography, with a foreword by Howard Zinn and an essay by Carol Mavor. After Hiroshima, with an essay by James Elkins, a chapbook of surrealist poetry, Camera Mouth, and holding history in our hand for the 75th commemoration of the Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombings. A big thank you to our UCCS bookstore that has set up a display out front, and you can purchase one of the books tonight, and Ellen has, has shared that she'd be happy to sign a copy if you, if you uh, want to take one home with you tonight. Ellen is a curator, a critic, an activist, and is currently artist in residence at University of California, Irvine until 2024. She was a professor of visual art, theory, and practice at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill for 27 years. She received her MFA in photography from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago and her BA from Sarah Lawrence College. And please, it is an honor to have her here with us at UCCS, so please join me in giving her a warm welcome. Ellen O'Hara Slavic. Um, it's nice to be here. 
I would like to acknowledge the Cheyenne, Ute, and Lipan Apache people and their unceded ancestral lands upon which the University of Colorado sits. Thank you all for being here. First, I want to thank Catherine Guinness for initializing this lecture and exhibition a few years ago, and a huge thank you to Daisy McGowan for agreeing to change the show entirely and to install 528 unframed silver gelatin prints of chemical drawings of the 528 above ground atmospheric nuclear tests done to date. Her expert eye, generous energy, and professionalism throughout this project have been exceptional. And I'd also like to thank the University of Colorado for making opportunities like these available for artists. And a big thank you to Lene Cravens and all the students, gallery workers, and extra help that came in to make this possible. <clears throat> this talk is about new work, much of which was made during a four-month Huntington Art and Research Fellowship at Caltech that ended June 1st. And this is the first time much of it is being exhibited. But this talk is also about projects I've been working on for decades. So this is the very first image I saw in the Caltech archives that I found online before my fellowship started when I searched for radiation. This is George Beadle and Ernst Anderson at Caltech's experimental farm in Arcadia, California, inspecting dwarf mutant corn, which was grown from progeny of seed exposed to radiation at the Bikini Atoll atomic bomb test. Without this information, the photograph is neutral. And this is one of 60 drawings of places the United, the United States has bombed that I did in 1999 of the Bikini Atoll from where the irradiated corn seeds came. The caption, Bikini Atoll, Republic of the Marshall Islands, 1948 to 58, location for 23 atmospheric atomic bomb tests. The Bravo test in 1954 was the most powerful bomb ever detonated by the US, a 15 megaton H-bomb. It vaporized three islands and spread radioactive debris over nearly 50,000 square miles. And this is in the show downtown. <clears throat> and this is the first thing I made, other than hundreds of iPhone photographs at Caltech, an attempt to organize and make connections between everything and to keep me focused during my fellowship. My students and I read about Cornelia Hess Honegger at Caltech in my Making Data Visual class. She's a really good friend of mine, and I love her work. Honegger is an artist and scientific illustrator making laborious paintings, sometimes with a one-hair brush, of deformed insects that she collects near nuclear facilities all over the world. Dr. Joan S. Davis writes in her essay, Thoughts on Images, in Hess Honegger's book After Chernobyl. Pictures record changes before science knows what to look for, and long before it knows what to measure. In the book Heteroptera, Heteroptera The Beautiful and the Other, Images of a Mutating World, Hess Honegger writes in the preface, I am convinced that scientific drawings and paintings were very often precognitive pictures rather than illustrations. The actual scientific research process took place during and through the picture making. For scientists, the pictorial process was a way of achieving knowledge. By way of introduction, I'll briefly share with you three previous projects that became books and are in part included in the exhibition. Bomb After Bomb, A Violent Cartography, a series of 60 drawings of places the US has bombed with a foreword by Howard Zinn. After Hiroshima, a series of cyanotypes of A-bombed artifacts and photographic contact prints of rubbings of A-bombed surfaces in Hiroshima with an essay by James Elkins. After the book came out, I expanded the project to include Fukushima and Nagasaki. And Holding History in Our Hand, a project done for Wilmington College's annual peace symposium on the occasion of the 75th commemoration of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. I will also share the six interrelated projects that I worked on at Caltech. The first one is a 3D printed sculpture of an A-bombed artifact, a glass bottle melted from the heat of the atomic bomb from the Hiroshima Peace Memorial Museum. Here are two plastic prototypes printed in the Caltech 3D lab, and you can see them in the show. <clears throat> two silver gelatin darkroom prints of archival negatives and transparencies of cloud chambers, wind tunnels, mostly white men and machines, scientific experiments and abstractions, both straight images, like the one on the right, that has Carl Anderson superimposed in the original negative of the interior of a B-29 aircraft loaded with a magnet cloud chamber for high-altitude cosmic ray experiments in 1948. 
and manipulated photographs like the one on the left, to which I added a dark vignetting around the edges in the darkroom, a photograph by Victor Neher of balloons over India. I ended up not including these in the show here, although a few test prints are incorporated into the collages that I'll show you later. The future book, Dark Archive, and here are two possible double-page spreads of Little Boy and Fat Man, the atomic bombs dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and photographs from Hiroshima from the Caltech archives. Four, a series of 528 chemical drawings of nuclear tests on photographic paper, a completely unexpected project that debuts here in Colorado. And I always like to encourage students to stay open to new ideas and processes while making art because whole new bodies of work can emerge. I had no intention of making this body of work when I went there and it ended up being to me the most important project. <clears throat> And five, The Blur of silent Science, a series of collages using only Caltech materials on surplus and defective sky atlas photographs from the Palomar Observatory. Machines and bombs, scientists and exposures, landscapes and illustrations hovering in space. And finally, six, a series of cyanotypes of objects from the Caltech archives, and these are of rocket heads. Did you know that Caltech produced over one million missile rockets during World War II? In case some of you don't know, a cyanotype is a sun print. The cyanotype process uses light-sensitive iron salts produced by brushing solutions of ferric ammonium citrate and potassium ferrocyanide, also known as Prussian blue, onto paper, which is then dried in the dark. I then take objects and place them on the prepared paper for 10 minutes in the sun and rinse them in water and hydrogen peroxide. <coughs> bomb after bomb. <coughs> So this is the last bomb drawing I did for the Bomb After Bomb project, and it includes flag pins at each place for which there is a corresponding drawing. Unlike typical landscape paintings, these drawings are based on surveillance, military, and aerial photo photography and maps. There is no sense of light. I think it's important to stress that I am one of those artists working against technology, or maybe not against it, but refusing to keep up with it, so that I don't participate in rendering things constantly obsolete. I utilize the hand and I make handmade things. Drawings with ink and graphite on paper, silver gelatin photographs in the wet darkroom, and cyanotypes. Howard Zinn wrote the foreword to my book. He said yes to this project without having ever met me. He was generous, radical, and wise. And it was just his 100th birthday last week. I mean, he died, but he said, every war is a, <laughs> sorry. He said, every war is a war against children and when you bomb a country ruled by a tyrant, you kill the victims of the tyrant. He made sense. He was a bombardier in World War II, dropping bombs on France towards the end of the war, which he lived to regret. From five miles high, he did not think about or see the damage and death as a result of those bombs. He wrote in my book, I am stunned by the thought that we, the civilized nations, have bombed cities and countrysides and islands for a hundred years. Yet here in the US, which is responsible for most of that, the public, as was true of me, does not understand, I mean really understand what bombs do to people. That failure of imagination, I believe, is critical to explaining why we still have wars, why we accept bombing as a common accompaniment to our foreign policies without horror or disgust. <clears throat> Anthropologist Catherine Lutz asked me in the interview in the book Bomb After Bomb, Perhaps you are responding to what Paul Virilio has identified as the intensifying speed of war warfare during the 20th century. If bombing, like other war technologies, is a primary engine of history, as he claims, and if history progresses at the speed of its weapon systems, how does your art respond to this problem? I responded, I feel defeated by this idea, even though I think it's true. I'm more interested in Virilio's claim that the true enemy becomes less external than internal, our own weaponry, our own scientific might, which in fact may promote the end of our own society. We are racing against ourselves, bombing ourselves, like here in Alaska. <clears throat> we are our own enemy. The Trinity test on July 6th, 1945 was the first test of a nuclear weapon by the US. Less than a month later, we dropped Little Boy on Hiroshima, and three days later, Fat Man on Nagasaki. I was surprised to find several negatives of the Trinity test in the Caltech archives, including the exact one I used as reference for my drawing decades earlier. 
And I didn't know until I was at Caltech that the detonators for Little Boy and Fat Man were in part designed at Caltech. Of course, this makes sense because many people there worked on the Manhattan Project, including the three Roberts, Oppenheimer, Christie, and Bakker, among others. Project Camel encompassed the work performed by Caltech in support of the Manhattan Project during World War II. This included the development of detonators, testing of bomb shapes dropped from B-29 Super Fortress bombers, and the Salt Wells pilot plant, where explosive components of nuclear weapons were manufactured. And here is the Trinity photograph again, and on the right, photographed on the light table to show the Los Alamos Photographic Laboratory stamp on the back. And here is a poem I wrote about working in the Caltech archives. The camera is like an experiment, the archive like the film inside, waiting to be exposed. Black boxes, machines for seeing in the dark, for recording light and invisibility. Until the box of glass slides and war notes is opened, there is nothing there. Structures of secrecy, of enclosing the truth about destruction, about research that dooms, blooming radiation clouds and balloons over India, cloud chambers over Antarctica. How can we see what we destroy in the name of science? <clears throat> the, full cap sorry, the full caption for this drawing on the right comes from Howard Zinn's book, Breaking the Silence. The atomic bomb Little Boy dropped on Hiroshima on August 6, 1945, turned into powder and ash in a few moments, the flesh and bones of 140,000 men, women, and children. 140,000. Three days later, a second atomic bomb dropped on Nagasaki killed 70,000 instantly. In the next five years, another 130,000 inhabitants of those two cities died of radiation poisoning. Those figures do not include countless other people who were left alive, but maimed, poisoned, disfigured, blinded. A Japanese schoolgirl recalled years later that it was a beautiful morning. She saw a B-29 fly by and then a flash. She put her hands up and my hands went right through my face. She saw a man without feet walking on his ankles. You'll see a darkroom black and white print made from this four by five color negative of a nuclear test at the Nevada Proving Ground later. So I grew up in an activist family. Every August 6, we'd go to our hometown of Portland, Maine, Central Square to commemorate Hiroshima. Here is my father, my nephew, and a friend with a banner he made that I included in an exhibition I curated in Amsterdam in 2002, Violent Violence, of 40 American artists addressing violence in their work. And this is from my essay in the book After Hiroshima. The first memory I have of Hiroshima is standing in Monument Square with my parents on Hiroshima Day, August 6, sometime in the 1970s, in my hometown of Portland, Maine. My father spoke, my mother spoke, I tried to speak. I had chosen a first-hand account of the atomic bombing written by a woman who survived it as a little girl. I could barely read it, choking on her memories of melting skin, maggots in the brain, losing her mother, her father, the disappearance of the world as she knew it. My six siblings and I were all taught to finish the food on our plates because they were starving children, to boycott gala wine, grapes, and lettuce in support of Cesar Chavez's battle for farm worker rights, to know and be unhappy about what was going on in the world. War, inequality, injustice, hunger, greed. Our parents took us to Europe often as my mother was a German citizen. My parents showed us glorious churches, the beautiful countryside, every open museum, and the Dachau concentration camp. Beauty and awe were coupled with horror and suffering. So after Hiroshima. Anna Atkins was a British botanist and published the very first book of photographs ever, which was of cyanotypes of plant specimens. It was not until I reread Carol Mavor's essay, Blossoming Bombs, in my Bomb After Bomb book, In Hiroshima, in which she discusses Anna Atkins' cyanotype of a poppy, that I had the idea of making cyanotypes in Japan. Seeing this along with the shadow on the left of a man sitting on the, banks, on the steps of a bank waiting for it to open and his shadow was left from the heat and light of the bomb. The first time I visited the Peace Museum, I did not make it past the first floor room of documentary films. These shadows stunned me as did the footage of a little girl fanning the ashes of her cremated father in a desire to cool him. Carol Maver writes in her essay, in 1953, Eve Klein saw the human shadow left on stone in front of the bank in Hiroshima and wrote, Hiroshima, the shadows of Hiroshima, in the desert of atomic catastrophe, they were a witness, without doubt terrible, but nevertheless a witness, 
both for the hope of survival and for permanence, albeit immaterial of the flesh. She continues, the poppy is a symbol of both memory and forgetting. Curiously, Atkins print looks like an x-ray, the first photograph to go into the body. The history of the atomic age is intertwined with photography. The discovery of radioactivity was via a photograph, this one on the left. In 1896, Henri Becquerel placed uranium on a photographic plate to expose it to the sun. Because it was cloudy, he put the experiment in a drawer, but the next day he developed the plate anyway, and to his amazement, he saw the outline of the uranium on the plate that had never been exposed to light. He correctly concluded the uranium was emitting a new form of penetrating radiation. Following in the steps of Becquerel, I went to Hiroshima to make autoradiographs like this one on the right. In this case, a fragment of an A-bomb tree from the Peace Museum's archive was placed on X-ray film for 10 days in light-tight conditions in the basement and then contact printed in the darkroom. Surprisingly, abstract exposures were made on the X-ray film. And I was stunned to discover that it was through the exposure of X-ray film stored in a vault that the Japanese finally knew it was an atomic bomb that had been dropped on them. These are cyanotypes of a piece of metal melted by the heat of the A-bomb, an atomic mask, a fragment of a steel beam from the Peace Dome, a ruin that stands at the heart of Peace Park, in the middle of downtown Hiroshima as a witness. The temperatures of an atomic bomb fireball exceed tens of millions degrees Celsius. The process and prob problem of exposure is central to my project. Countless people were exposed to the radiation of the atomic bomb. Those who survived are known as Habaksha. I'm exposing already exposed A-bombed objects on cyanotype paper and X-ray film, but this time it is the radiation within them or the sun that is causing the exposure. Invited to participate in an exhibition in a rural region in Fukushima, I made cyanotypes on site and exhibited them, along with works from Hiroshima and Nagasaki, in the classroom of an evacuated school. I made cyanotypes of implements from the school infirmary and installed them on the infirmary bed that I dragged into the classroom. And immediately after the project in Fukushima, I had a show at Gallery G in Hiroshima that included cyanotypes made in Fukushima and Hiroshima, and it was up through August 6th, Hiroshima Day. When asked by a Hiroshima reporter what it was I most wanted to communicate in one sentence, I replied, to remind people of everything that is lost in war. So this is the project with which I applied for the Huntington Caltech Fellowship. This blue bottle at the top is one of 90,000 A-bombed artifacts in the Hiroshima Peace Museum archive. And these are two different cyanotypes of the same bottle. I proposed making a sculptural replica through the 3D printing process of this bottle to be installed on campus. <clears throat> and here is another cyanotype of four A-bombed artifacts a still from my friend David Tinapple's STL file of the bottle for the 3D printing, the first blue prototype printed in the Caltech lab, and an archival photograph in the Caltech archives that had no information on it, but it just was uncannily similar to what I was doing. So it was my hope, can I play this, yes, okay. So it was my hope to print this in titanium at the Jet Propulsion Lab, JPL, at NASA, and to install it on the Caltech campus. And I would have installed it with information about how research done at Caltech contributed to the transformation of this bottle and other related facts. But unfortunately, NASA would not allow it. So right now, they just exist as prototypes. And this is just a video that my friend David sent me from his making the SDL file for me, which I love, actually. I'm, I'm kind of a Luddite, so to me that looks super, super tech. Um, <laughs> okay, um, so this is the second prototype from the Caltech 3D Lab. Susan Stewart writes that souvenirs privatize history. The Hiroshima artifacts are not souvenirs and are not held by an individual but by a public institution, the Peace Memorial Museum. They do not privatize history, but they reveal it. So my friends and I here are making a cyanotype on the banks of a Hiroshima river that was once filled with corpses. Susan Sontag writes, photographs of the suffering and martyrdom of a people are more than reminders of death or failure or of victimization. They invoke the miracle of survival. So my friends took a break from the rehearsal of the annual play Grandchildren of Hiroshima to make this cyanotype with me. 
and it became one of 13 billboards throughout Ohio for Wilmington College's annual Peace Symposium and for the 75th Memorial of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And I love how my friends are ascending up into the sky in the billboard. <clears throat> the other project for the Peace Symposium is the book Holding History in Our Hand, and there's a copy in the show from the Peace Resource Center's archive and my own. While looking through hundreds of files, I started making photographs with my iPhone of the photos in my hand, and the more I did that, the more I loved the idea of holding history in our hand as an idea. Art writer Amy White writes, the act of holding and then documenting both the hand and that which is held constitutes a form of self-portraiture, implicating the artist as participant, exposing participatory embeddedness, an attempt to pictorialize culpability. It is the contradictions and questions of how to be an ethical artist addressing war and loss, archives and history, survival and violence that drove me to make this book. Here is an archival photograph of the Urakami Cathedral in Nagasaki after the bombing and two of mine from 2016 on the right. Susie Linfield writes in her book, The Cruel Radiance, Photography and Political Violence. We cannot blame photography for having failed to vanquish violence. As James Nahue argues, the greatest statesmen, philosophers, humanitarians have not been able to put an end to war. Why place that demand on photography? The real issue is how we use images of cruelty. Can they help us to make meaning of the present and the past? So I chose photographs that moved me due to their aesthetic properties, historical significance, or personal reference. Most are decades old and were made as documentary proof of significant events and human experience, like these of people at Sadako Sasaki Children's Peace Monument in Hiroshima decades ago, and in 2008, my photograph of school children singing at the monument. Sadako Sasaki is the girl who folded over a thousand paper cranes in the hope and belief that it would save her. She died of leukemia from exposure to the radiation from the atomic bomb. And this is from the afterword in the book. Holmfell and Hesselberth write in their essay, Ledgers and Legibility, a conversation on the significance of noise within digital colonial archives. What new sites of forgetfulness and unspeakability are created by the desire for mass digitation and big data aggregates? How to account for the viscerality inherent to the archives? the touch, smell, and materiality of the analog records, and the pain, suffering, and violence that the archive is constituted upon. Confronted with the archive, I had to ask myself how to position myself in relation to it, or perhaps rather, how the archive orients and positions me to question my own position now and the privilege I hold being able to work in and with archives in the first place." End quote. These questions have pervaded my research since 2008. And Annette Decker quotes Arjun Apadure in her essay, What It Means to Be Lost and Living in Archives. We should begin to see all documentation as intervention and all archiving as part of some sort of, of a collective project. Rather than being the tomb of the trace, the archive is more frequently the product of the anticipation of collective memory. So Caltech darkroom prints. <clears throat> So this is little boy and fat man super, superimposed on each other by sandwiching two negatives in the enlarger. I'm trying to make meaning through new images of profound historical importance that inform our current condition of constant violence, the ever proliferating military industrial complex, war and aftermath. Caltech archivist Peter Colopy told me about the dark rooms in the basement of Keith Spaulding building that used to be part of the impressive graphic resources department, where they made sky atlas photographs from glass plate negatives from the Palomar Observatory, passport photos, scientific illustrations, and where they bound books and much, much more. I cleaned up one of the Sky Atlas processing dark rooms, those two doors in the back of the Xerox machine storage room and bought a four by five enlarger from Irvine to make silver gelatin prints from archival negatives and transparencies on old paper that was left there, much of it outdated and fogged, but some like new. And I also make photographs of glass lantern slides and transparencies layered on top of each other on the light table in the Caltech archives, like these two, of a Caltech lab, a nuclear explosion, and the decimated Hiroshima landscape. If I print these using the enlarger, the mushroom clouds and Hiroshima landscape will be positive, and the Caltech lab with the latter will be negative. Susan Sontag writes in regarding the pain of others, the landscape of devastation is still a landscape. There is beauty in ruins. Photographs tend to transform whatever their subject, 
and as an image, something may be beautiful or terrifying or unbearable or quite bearable as it is not in real life. Transforming is what art does. So these are more layered glass slides from the papers of William Fowler, Caltech scientist with rockets in the office on left and layered Hiroshima and Nagasaki negatives on the right, compressing, making, and aftermath of war. Being in an archive is like being in a camera. Every time the aperture opens, a magical sound of light and fine metal, an image appears that is forever gone. Cameras are clocks for seeing, wrote Roland, Roland Bart. An archive is a warehouse of clocks, timepieces clicking out of sync, needing new batteries or to be plugged in. Photography requires light and time. Archives are still. They meet in the future present. So like my bomb drawings that were originally called protesting cartography, these maps were made and utilized by institutions like Caltech, governments, the military, and individuals in the name of war. These are also layered glass lantern slides. So I call these Monster Man, two darkroom prints of sandwich negatives of Robert Milliken holding a cloud chamber or cosmic ray equipment in his hands. Milliken was awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics for his work on the elementary charge of electricity and on the photoelectric effect. He is or was known as the patron saint of Caltech. And I learned of Milliken the eugenicist from the extraordinary video, Sitting Down with Uncomfortable Things in the Caltech Archives, that Peter Colopy and Maura Dykstra organized with students as part of the series Critical Intersections, Conversations on History, Race, and Science. Caltech President Rosenbaum said Milliken lent his name and prestige to a morally reprehensible eugenics movement that had already been discredited scientifically during his time. How do we reconcile science and politics, genius and flawed ideology, institutional memory and inhumane practices? Maybe we can't reconcile it, but we can try to represent it. So this is a color four by five transparency of a nuclear test, and there were two different ones of this test, so I sandwiched them in the larger to make the print that you see on the right. <clears throat> I am drawn to the use of the vignetting as a circular magnifying lens, an oculus, the plutonium core of Trinity, a cloud chamber image, an eye, the world, a peephole, a microscope, micro and macro. I am struck by institutional connections between private and public, government and military, educational, scientific, corporate, and photographic. Here is an Atomic Energy Commission envelope for the transparency you just saw and a photo of a nuclear test photographed from the back. There are so many incredible images in the Caltech archives, and this is one of them, a glossy silver gelatin print of an aerial view from the bomber pilot's perspective of a nuclear test that includes, in my reflective iPhone shot, the pilot's cockpit clock, literal measurements of height and time, perspectival distance, light and shadow, and when placed on the light table, as on the right side image, the provenance of the image, Los Alamos Photographic Laboratory. This is of Operation Sandstone on the Eniwetok Atoll, for which I also did a bomb drawing, one of three huge kil kiloton tests, X-ray, yolk, and zebra, in total, the U.S. did 43 nuclear tests there. And this is another one of my favorite images in the archive, both as an object, a black and white 4 by 5 negative that is cracked and speckled with time of Clark Milliken in a wind tunnel with a plane. <clears throat> and this is the negative on the left and my darkroom print on the right. To me, it looks as if the man is standing inside a scuba diver's helmet the wind tunnel, a human head atop a cloaked body deep in space, surrounded by an infinitely starry sky. There is so much going on in this picture. And here is Clark Milliken with a model of a DC-1 plane in Galsit in a 10-foot wind tunnel in 1932, and sandwiched with the previous image in an archival cloud chamber image. <clears throat> so here is Peter holding an ion chamber a Russell Porter drawing of the Palomar Observatory, and one of my photographs made from a cloud chamber transparency. Again, the circle, the aperture, the orb, the micro and macro, the optical materiality, the dark chamber, and the use of light. Both of these positive prints were made by sandwiching negatives in the enlarger to single out Marie Curie on the left and to create an impossible and confusing cinematic thing. The negatives at the top right are photographed on the light table, and I plan to make a contact print of them arranged like this. But for the image at the bottom, I layered them for this effect. 
And these are layered glass slides of groups of white men. There are countless images of white men in the archives. These four images were made using eight glass slides, layering two for each picture. And of course, there are images of women in the archives too, some engaged critically, scientifically, and others represented in the most offensive and problematic way, like this one from the Los Alamos photo lab and found in Robert Bacher's papers. Saturday night, two explosions, the hydrogen bomb, the pure, the pure blood Mexican, which one do you prefer? I learned of Edith Wallace's amazing, I can never say this right, Drosophila or Dros, Drosophila, I can never remember. I learned of Edith Wallace's amazing Drosophila drawings from the Caltech exhibition, Becoming Caltech. And they were the first images I requested to look at in the archives and they deserve a book of their own. They're absolutely stunning. And I love the caption in my photograph of one of her illustrations in a book. The image on the right says, an investigation of the effect of any gene involves a comparison. So this leads into the book project Dark, Archi Dark Archive, which is also the name of the show. It's the working title for a book I'm currently working on. And it's a book that will be about Caltech archives specifically, but it is about so many archives. The idea and practice and engagement with and activation of the archive itself, as well as the history of weapons productions, image development and use, photographic records as records of truth and propaganda, scientific research as visual experimentation and proof, among other things. So on the left, it's another photograph in the darkroom from a transparency <clears throat> of one of Edith Wallace's um, illustrations and an accidental abstraction fished out of the darkroom garbage at the end of my session on the right, which is uncannily, uncannily similar to the image on the left. How am I doing on time? Okay. Um, so this is art and science perfectly combined, in my opinion. It's a photographic collage of or by Edward Lewis Drosophila studies. I'm drawn to the back as much as to the front, the stains of time and exposure, chemical residue from the photographs. I found some exquisite negatives of Edward Lewis's flies stuck between the photographs and I printed them in the darkroom. They didn't even think they had the negatives and I found them in the, in the prints. I was so excited. So this made me gasp. It literally made me gasp when I saw these because it looks so contemporary. Um, and it's only one in a series of beautiful abstractions that remind me of my atomic mask, the cyanotype I showed earlier from Hiroshima of a steel beam. And these are from the papers of Charles C. Lauridson and it's data for a thesis on electron emissions from 1929. The back of the photograph reads Pyrex Q tube, wine number 16, 15 minutes, spot and shadow at 12,500 volts. And there's literal holes in these, in these silver gelatin prints. <clears throat> there will be a section in the book of abstractions, microscopic and experimental images made in the process of discovery and archiving. Documenting the process is an instant archive. Archiving is a process. Every photograph is an archive. On the left is a signed image of a synchrotron beam from 1952, and on the right, a primary X-ray from synchrotron event 557, G5 emulsion from the papers of Carl D. Anderson. A synchrotron is an extremely powerful source of X-rays. The X-rays are produced by high energy electrons as they circulate around the synchrotron. And these are from the papers of Bakker and the Manhattan Project. Um, Trinity detonation, these two amazing images are of astrophysics exposures and the disintegration of lithium-8 from 1929. Also from the same folder, these are layered glass slides of the Trinity test with landscapes, Caltech labs, and two, the Washington Monument for scale. I am struck by the disappearance of whole cities and peoples, structures and nature, not just by bombs and war, the A-bomb and natural disasters, but by deliberate and calculated progress, development, profit, and growth. As Paul Virilio says, when you build a sailing vessel, you guarantee a shipwreck. And that is my favorite quote of all time. When you build a sailing vessel, you guarantee a shipwreck. Well, that and J um, Frederick Jameson's It's Easier to Imagine the End of the World Than the End of Capitalism. That's, that might be also my favorite. I have a lot of favorites, but those two. <clears throat> so from the Metropolitan Museum of Art, quote, 
In the 1930s, Harold Edgerton, a professor of engineering at MIT, pioneered techniques of ultra-high-speed stroboscopic photography to reveal aspects of the moving world previously invisible to the naked eye, a speeding bullet eviscerating an apple, which many of you probably know, or the graceful, graceful spiral of a gulf stroke, or the coronet formed by a falling drop of milk. Those are his fav famous images. But he also made images like this on the left. During World War II, Edgerton worked with the Atomic Energy Commission to develop a camera, the Rapatronic, capable of capturing the fleeting incandescent flash of a nuclear explosion. Edgerton and his assistants set up their equipment on a tower seven miles from the nuclear test site, using exposures as short as one billionth of a second, recorded this ominous glowing shape hovering like an alien life form or a colossal balloon. Made when the dream of technology threatened to turn into a nightmare, Edgerton's haunting images of nuclear explosions help us visualize the inconceivable. And so this is the beginning of the chemical drawings of nuclear tests, and you can see, I didn't start out working from images, I just worked from my mind, but then I started looking at images and working from the images, so it's sort of a loose take on his photograph. So while waiting for the glass lantern slides to be prepared for me in the archive so I could print with them, I started to throw away the boxes of all the fogged and outdated paper, and then I thought, wait, I'll try to draw a mushroom cloud and see what would happen. And six hours later, I had the first 30, and then I was hooked. And um, using brushes, I used Fixer first as the white, functioning as a resist to the developer, and then fixing the whites, and then I applied developer for the blacks. And there's 528, because there have been 528 above ground nuclear tests. Um, so I did them on the paper left in the sky atlas processing darkroom, which feels very significant to me. And 215 of these above ground tests were done by the US, 219 by Russia. And no wonder there's so much cancer in the world. And there were 1,528 underground tests as well for a total of 2,056 nuclear tests. In his book, Nuclear Bodies, the Global Habak Shah, nuclear historian Robert A. Jacobs re-envisions the history of the Cold War as a slow nuclear war, fought on remote battlegrounds against populations powerless to prevent the contamination of their lands and, and bodies. His comprehensive account necessitates a profound rethinking of the meaning, costs, and legacies of our embrace of nuclear weapons and technologies. In it, he writes, in the fall of 1961, President Kennedy somberly warned Americans about deadly radioactive fallout clouds extending hundreds of miles from H-bomb detonations, yet he approved 96 U.S. nuclear weapons tests for 1962. <clears throat> Cold War nuclear testing, production, and disasters like Chernobyl and Fukushima have exposed millions to dangerous radioactive particles. These millions are the global habaksha. Many communities continue to be plagued with dire legacies and ongoing risks, sickness and early mortality, forced displacement, uncertainty and anxiety, dislocation from ancestors and traditional lifestyles, and contamination of food sources and ecosystems. The invisibility of global habaksha is manufactured in both science and politics. Studies of the Habakshah in Hiroshima and Nagasaki built models of risk on external exposures and ignored internal exposures that would have been far more common. Nuclear weapon states do not want to acknowledge that weapons effects like fallout, which are designed for war, constitute actual warfare when inflicted on people during tests. That's end quote. And Bo Jacobs, who's also a good friend of mine, uses a lot of my husband's research, and I could talk about that for another whole hour, but my husband's an epidemiologist who studies the effects of radiation on workers all over the world, so we've done a lot of things together, but <clears throat> that's kind of how this work started. So while these are of nuclear tests, they, they conjure tornadoes, trees, embryos, abortions, brains, skulls, sonograms, stains, orbs, eruptions, and Rorschach tests. And I've always told my students that photography requires light. If nothing else, you have to have light. However, these photographs or chemical drawings, they don't use light at all, which just has me in a total funk. There's no exposure. It's just time and process, chemical and paper. The outdated paper turns black in the developer because it has been fogged from age. Maybe some became fogged from exposure to light over time, but all of this paper was stored in a deep, dark basement for years. My Rolfer suggested perhaps the papers fogged from radiation. Who knows? From the Oak Ridge Museum of Radiation and Ra Radioactivity, quote, prior to World War II, Kodak had gone to considerable trouble to ensure that the cardboard it used for packing its film was free of radioactive contamination. 
Kodak had learned that cardboard made from recycled products could be contaminated due to materials originating from the radium industry. They made arrangements with the paper mill in Indiana to produce cardboard from carefully selected raw materials. Shortly after the atomic bomb was dropped on Hiroshima, Kodak observed spotting on film that they traced back to contamination in their cardboard. Dr. J.H. Webb, a Kodak employee, studied the matter and concluded that the contamination must have come from a nuclear explosion somewhere in the US. It came from the world's first nuclear explosion, the Trinity Test. Fallout from the explosion had contaminated the river water that the mill in Indiana had used to manufacture the cardboard pulp. Recognizing the sensitivity of this information, Dr. Webb waited until 1949 before publishing the story in the open literature. As a partial response, Kodak installed air samplers in the intake for their building ventilation system to monitor for fallout." End quote. Did our government supply air samplers for people living near nearby or downwind from these tests? Film is more valuable than lives. So blur of science. <clears throat> So I've made 200 of these collages on defective or duplicate Sky Atlas silver gelatin prints, and they're 14 inches by 14 inches. They're contact prints from these gorgeous glass plate negatives that I found down in the dark room that are now in the archives. They were just going to be thrown away. I'm only using materials collected or made at Caltech, like these two with test reject prints of mine from the dark room. Carl Anderson, again, superimposed in a B-29 bomber with a cloud chamber, collaged with a man in another cloud chamber and one of the nuclear tests from a color transparency, the hot pink one I showed earlier on the right. And here are Millikan's hands again, holding a cloud chamber part with a print of mine of a nuclear test. I had the impulse to do these after looking through a big box of photographs I found in the dark rooms that included pictures of Einstein that the archives didn't have, but that also included pictures of a baby in a stroller, a Human Betterment Foundation rally, which is a eugenicist organization in Kansas, images from Mars, labs, rockets, spacecraft, people I do not know, and famous people like Feynman, all mixed up together. It was like the entire world, past, present, and future in one box. And I was also incredibly inspired by the solar telescope in Lynn Hall on Caltech campus, and it was one of my favorite places. And here's a photograph of the sun reflected or projected on the glass next to one of my collages that folds the sky with planets, and that one's in the show. Here are four shapes hurtling through space and planets on Mars. I've made collages since childhood, and it is one of my most consistent practices as an artist. Collages are hysterical surprises, fragmented landscapes, delirious layers of appropriation and reaction, subconscious and automatic narratives in the surrealist spirit, absurd juxtapositions and ambiguous hetero heterotopias. Collage is a means to collide times, to forget and remember, refuse and celebrate, to whimsically collect and discard scraps of everything. And I have no idea what's happening in either of these pictures. A man with an enormous jaw-like pipe and women putting notes into a skull-top tree, all in deep and flat space. And here are Robert Oppenheimer and Albert Einstein. In 1947, Einstein wrote, since the completion of the first atomic bomb, nothing has been accomplished to make the world safer from war, while much has been done to increase the destructiveness of war. In the first two years of the atomic era, another phenomenon is to be noted. The public, having been warned of the horrible nature of atomic warfare, has done nothing about it, and to a large extent has dismissed the warning from its consciousness. So the last project I'll share with you today is from the series of cyanotypes of objects in the Caltech archives, and I find it amusing that illuminated white shadows are left by inert light bulbs through the cyanotype process, two flash bulbs on the left and an unidentified pentode on the right. On left is a styrofoam crystal structure, and on the right is a spare ion chamber. And these are parts of Carl Anderson's Geiger counters that he used in the 1930s in his seven-inch cloud chamber, and these are in the show. <clears throat> and these are two more rocket heads, those missile tips just oriented differently on the paper. And this is from James Elkin's essay in my book, After Hiroshima. These photographs are not fixed shadows in the usual sense, and they are not even single images of single shadows. That is a challenge for the conceptualization of technical photography, which remains limited to a general discussion of the digital. These cyanotypes are certainly part of the current interest in the indexical, in records of objects that are made directly, physically, by their proximity to the paper, film, or charge coupling device. So Edith Wallace was a biologist and illustrator for Thomas Hunt Morgan's genetics lab, both at Columbia and then after 1928 at Caltech. 
Her drawings were some of the earliest detailed color images of Drosophila to circulate among scientists. For scientists hunting mutations that could help them map a chromosome or discover how genes influence each other, the tiniest, tiniest variation in a fly's appearance could be an important scientific clue. Molecular models, interconnected planets, a game of jacks, a modernist chandelier, a sculptural object of dynamic beauty, animated yet still in a sea of blue. I listened to Hibakusho or, or a bomb survivor, Okada Amiko, give her harrowing account of survival as an eight-year-old girl. She concluded, there are now over 30,000 nuclear weapons in this world. Hiroshima and Nagasaki are not past events. They are about today's situation. Stop nuclear power, stop nuclear weapons, stop war. And I should say that the nuclear weapons now are 10 times stronger, 100 times stronger than the bombs dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And this print was, this is what I did to test the paper to see if it was fogged in, in the darkroom. So this is one of the test prints. So Howard Zinn told me that we cannot imagine, if we cannot imagine a world without nuclear weapons, there will never be one. And I close with this quote by John Berger, who's my favorite writer of all time, who wrote in his novel, A Painter of Our Time, we have, each have to decide everything for ourselves. We each have to choose what is inconceivable for us. As artists, and this is the curse that is upon us, we must each visualize our own city, ourself as its center. It is bitter for me to admit this, I who, as a man, believe in the collective, in the revolutionary class, not the revolutionary individual. I do not want a public with great aesthetic sensibility. I want a public with one thing, hope. So thank you all for being here, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you so much. Thank you. You really, you call us all to see and to look and to pay attention. I think we have time for a couple questions. Um, I can bring a microphone to you if you have something to ask. Sorry, it was longer than I thought. I cut a lot. Your work is very inspiring, and uh, it's, it's great to see somebody taking action. Over the years, uh, you've developed this art. I just wanted to know kind of the background about how you got into it. Um, and how it became kind of political for you and where you see your art going in the future from those standpoints. Well, thank you very much. Um, well, I talked a little bit about my family, but I'm the youngest of seven and my sisters are all artists, so it's very strange. Um, so I grew up with a lot of art, um, but my early work, which I didn't show, I talked about it, I gave a talk here last year via Zoom but my early work was very feminist and body-oriented, a lot of erotic sexual stuff, um, which to me was also political, but in a really different way. And then it sort of shifted from the body, my body, to a more familial or national or global body. So to me, it felt very organic that it, it developed that way, that that was the trajectory. But, you know, I was either going to be a lawyer or an artist. I was the president of the debate team in high school, and I went to Debate Institute in summers, um, and I still kind of want to be a lawyer or president. <laughs> but, um, but I chose art because it just was, I'm just compelled to be an artist. I think most artists are just compelled to be artists. Like, I don't feel like I have a choice. And I do make, like, I make hundreds of collages all the time. And they're not all political. Like I make a lot of work that I think is just like beautiful and formally fun. And but I think because of who, every artist is like this, whatever you make is the sum total of everything you've done up until that point and everything you've experienced. And because I am a pretty political, politically activated and motivated person, it's just I can't avoid it in the work. And so it just makes sense to me. Um, where it's going? You know, I'm working on this book called Dark Archive. Um, I'm always. I didn't expect to make the work I made at Caltech. I went there completely not knowing what I was gonna do other than maybe this sculpture based on the bottle, but um, that, that ended up sort of being a sidebar. So I don't know exactly what I'll be doing, but I do want to make some of these chemical drawings really big. I have some old mural paper, so I wanna just make them very large. I think it would be incredible to have the nuclear clouds, you know, 
not life size, you couldn't make them life size, but you know, big, bigger than me as a person, I think that would be, so that's something I'm thinking of doing, but. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> thank you for that talk, that was really quite uh, wonderful. I, I'm wondering um, what your, your relationship with um, indexicality is and how you want the viewer to respond to the work because it points to, it, it seems like a lot of your work is pointing to like in a kind of a one-to-one -one way, mm -hmm. but in, in very mediated, in ve many different you know, layers of mediation. But for as a viewer, I can't help but be drawn to the work itself. It, it's, there's elements of abstraction in it, and it's beautiful. And so I, I guess I'm curious as what would your, not ideal uh, vision of for, for the beholder, what would that look like, but how do you uh, try to um, come to terms with the fact that the audience might be drawn to this beauty and what that beauty is in a, in a way kind of pointing to, but in, it, it oscillates for me, because mm -hmm. it's pointing to these, this atroc these, these yeah. horrible things, but I can't help but be absorbed by how mm -hmm. wonderful the work is. And then I remember, oh no, but it's, and then I have this kind of oscillating. So I guess I'm just curious yeah. how you come to terms with that for your audience. Yeah. Well, thank you. I, I mean, that's a question a very differently asked, thank you. But about beauty, I get asked a lot. But, and I always like to just remind people of Andre Breton's quote that beauty will be convulsive or it won't be at all. That beauty is a strategy to get people motivated or provoked by the work. And I think it can be really subversive. Um, I, I think of it as a subversive tool because if you can't get people to look at the work, then you've lost, right? I mean, you have to get people engaged and seduced by the work. And so I think beauty or formal qualities are the way to do that. I mean, the bomb drawings, you know, I, I got my MFA in photography. I'm really a photo person, but, and my sisters are painters. And so when I started the bomb drawings, I wasn't really confident about those very much. And I wrote to them, I was like, can I do these? They're like, oh, just keep doing them. But one reason why I chose painting was I thought it was this more abstract, beautiful approach and handmade, and people would be able to look at them. And I was in a fellowship with a bunch of fellows who was like, oh, you have to hang pictures next to corpses. I mean, you have to hang pictures of corpses next to the... It's like, no, I'm not going to do that, because people have seen those, and you get desensitized, and I want people to enter the work into a new way. So I saw a lot of people come to those bomb drawings just loving them visually, formally, but then they read the captions, and they would be so surprised. And they, some people were like, did you work for the CIA? Like, how did you know about all these bombings? I was like, no, I didn't work for the CIA. I just did a lot of research, and I didn't know about a lot of those places. I didn't know we had done three huge nuclear underground tests in Alaska. I had no idea. And I thought I knew about every bombing, because I grew up in a total pacifist, activist family. But So anyways, I'm digressing. But I think beauty is a strategy, um, and I use it a lot, and I, and I do think a lot of artists do use it to talk about really difficult. I mean, Goya's Disasters of War series are beautiful prints, even though they're of the most horrific things, and Picasso's Guernica is an amazing photograph, and Lewis Hines' photographs of child laborers that help bring about labor laws. They're beautiful photographs, even though they're of terrible things. So there's that. And then the question about indexicality, I just think indexicality is so inherent to photography. Um, but for me, the Hiroshima work is really where I, it was very important for me to be able to put those things on the paper. And I didn't show any of the rubbings in my talk, I don't think. Did I? I don't think I did. But I do, there's some in the show. But I did rubbings of A-bomb surfaces, and then I did contact prints of those rubbings in the dark room. And to me, they're powerful because I touched the surfaces of these things that survived the A-bomb, and there's something about touching that history and that trauma that still resides in the image, even though it's just an image. So, and I talked about this earlier over lunch with Lene and Daisy, that I had a gallery that represented me in LA for a while. They have since closed, but they wouldn't show my work unless I agreed to have some of the cyanotypes be um, edition prints, which I did not want them to be edition prints at all because that takes away the power of them, but they weren't going to show me unless I did that. So I agreed to have five of them. They chose five of them. And of course, they sold more of the edition prints because they're cheaper. But anyway, they still work as images. I think they're very powerful. And you wouldn't even know they're edition prints because they look just like the original. But I know that they're not the original. There's something about the paper having been in Japan under these objects that carries so much power in history that is really important to me. 
So I hope that, yeah. Well, I, I want to um, honor our time here and your time, and so I encourage you to, to stay. And um, the books, one of the books is available out, out front in the lobby, and I, I hear we also have a number of cookies uh, there for you. <laughs> um, and then, of course, tomorrow night, <clears throat> if you haven't been to our downtown location, uh, the exhibition really is a must-see. It's um, You've seen a lot of the work here, but to see it in the space, um, I really encourage you, if you can come down tomorrow night, uh, 5 to 8 p.m., and actually the gallery will be open from 1 to 8 tomorrow, and then um, it will be on view through October 8th, so I hope you can join us, but please, uh, uh, Ellen will also be there tomorrow evening. And, yes, uh, I will, and I just wanted to say two other things about it, is that okay. I have some copies of the Bomb After Bomb book there at the gallery, so if you want that, but also I counted today, and there's 580 pieces of work in that show. <laughs> So Daisy really did an unbelievable job, well, and it's probably the biggest show I've ever had. So. Well, and thank you thank again you. to our students who were such a big part of that. And I, I want to also just give a shout out. We have a brand new gallery manager, Lene Bowman Cravens, has joined us uh, from Texas. She's just this is her second week, and so please give her a warm welcome. You see her too. And thank you again, Ellen O'Hara Slavic. We are so fortunate to have you here to show this work to uh, to all um, you know. We're, being together in the space and to witness this together, uh, I'm so grateful to be able to do that. Thank you Thanks. so much. Thank you.